blower door. I feel and like I you bet- can rent them. I feel like I've heard people talk about renting them. Patrick, well, stop, if you can track that down, that'd be great Patrick, info, Kylie. We, we should be starting this business ourselves. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, Jeff, can you do me a favor and just erase the last couple minutes of our yeah, conversation? No problem. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and asphalt impregnated fibrous sheathing aimed at anybody (laughs) who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Kylie Jacques, GBA Editor. Hello. Rob Wadsack, Digital Brand Manager. Hey there. And the amazing producer, Jeff Rose. Hi. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com and please... You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. People who listen to this must, you know, they must think I do this the first time, every single time, but... No. (laughs) You did go a little off script today. Feeling creative? Oh, my God. So we've had a rash of uh, questions about asphalt impregnated fibrous sheathing. So it's definitely a theme for today. Well, I'm sure there's plenty of that stuff still out there. It's a problem. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, what have you guys been doing? You go first, Rob. Me go first. Oh, well, uh, you you said to me when I sent you some pictures of my car that I was working on the other day, you were like, I wish I had your enthusiasm for new projects. And uh, (laughs) I, I have to say that, you know, I've, you know, for 20 years, I've been trying to find some sort of balance with owning a house and doing my creative work and just taking care of everything. And, and I realized recently that like none of it actually has to get done in order for me to live comfortably. Like there's no schedule. It's like my kitchen is fully functional. It could have waited another 10 years for me to remodel it, but I enjoy doing the work and I have to remind myself of that. And I'm, it's sort of my daily uh, mantra is that, uh, you know, do the work because you enjoy it, not because you have to get it done. Oh, get to work. (laughs) (laughs) No, but seriously, it's like we put so much pressure on ourselves to get these projects done. And, um, well, yeah, I'm going to interject here. I, I, you know, I've been yeah. working on my rusty cars, and last weekend was no exam, uh, exception. I, I was like, cool, and started leaking out of the CRV. So now I got to fix that. Now I got a car up on ramp stands, right? Yeah. Like, so I, you, I don't think it's fair to home. say. What do you, you work from home. What do you need a car for? <laughs> <laughs> you all can I, shut up. I have to do all of it all by myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so basically. So I, to get Why back are you to me, pulling the chrome off your perfectly fine car? Can it's I not ask perfectly that? Perfectly fine. So you, you guys know I have this 1980 280ZX Datsun, and um, it's a it's a mint Survivor car. It is not perfect, but there's nothing wrong with it. And you no. just pulled all the chrome off of it. Yeah. So so the the from the side it looks beautiful, but from the top the sun just completely mm. baked the paint on this car, and it's starting to get rust spots in the roof and the and the hood. And uh, a buddy of mine uh, restores antique cars and said it, once he gets some space in his shop, we could paint it one weekend. So I I just I'm tired of having old cars that I enjoy and never actually working on them. So, okay, I took a day off from my uh, my remodeling project and stripped all the chrome and, and the bumpers and everything off of off. So of how many after. pieces did you break and what's it going to cost to replace those parts? <laughs> no, surprisingly, I was impressed because I figured, you know, old cars, like really old cars are easy to take apart because they just bolt together. But the newer the car, they have all these plastic clips and weird hidden fasteners and things. I was actually pretty impressed. There are less pieces and all of them were pretty accessible. The only troublesome pieces were around the windshield where these plastic clips are embedded into the adhesive under the glass. And most people say you'll never get them back on anyway. So I just cut them all off with a knife. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there's a couple little kinks in the stainless trim around the windshield, but everything else came off nice. So it's like ready, almost ready for paint. So I'm going to ask our listeners, all right, what are the odds that Rob is ever going to put this car back together or he's going to sell it with the parts in the trunk when it comes time? <laughs> well, that, that would, it wouldn't be the first time <laughs> that happened. So. That's a sweet little car. I used to like seeing you show it up. It used to office. be until yeah. he pulled all the trim well, off of it. <laughs> it's lighter. It's lighter weight now for racing. <laughs> right. It's a bicycle. <laughs> but, but anyway, but, but so my kitchen project, I haven't really done a whole lot other than choose a lot of materials by I bought a sink. We think we picked out a faucet. We think we picked out countertops and it's almost, I swear it's almost more work picking all the materials for a project like a kitchen than it is actually putting them in. It I bet a take- lot of architects would agree with you. 
Yeah, it's it's surprising. The I don't think anyone who has to carry like kitchen cabinets would agree with you. I didn't say it was harder. <laughs> I'm not saying I, I agree. Just, I didn't say it was physically harder. I just said it, I probably will spend more time making time. decisions about this kitchen than I will actually working on it. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that. Yeah. yeah. So briefly. That's supposed to be the uh, fun part, though. Oh, yeah. Briefly. Well, you were talking about uh, making your own countertops, and you're looking for some low buck options, as most people are, right? Um, stone is out. Uh, you considered uh, solid surface, or no? So no, we we definitely wanted something that I made, or you know, something that's. I wanted something that is um, I can maintain myself. That if it get it is not going to get damaged to the point where I actually have to replace it. And the the two choices were wood and concrete. We're pretty much set on wood now, and. Um, we're pr pretty sure we're going to go with walnut. And so I was weighing all of the different choices and I could go with solid, you know, walnut from the local hardwood supply house that has stuff that I'll have to plane down and joint the edges and glue together and uh, make a countertop out of some, you know, rough boards. Um, or I could go buy, you know, at Lowe's or Lumber Liquidators or wherever, uh, those slabs of glued up little strips. And I always thought those little strips. They're ones, not gonna. You're not gonna find that in Walnut, I bet you. No, they do. They do really? have it in Walnut at, 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 at Lumber Liquidators. They did in eight foot and twelve foot sections. And um, the thing is, I always thought that it would. You know, I'm putting all this work into this kitchen. I want it to be all of these nice handmade details. And um, we've been I've been watching a lot of these like home design shows lately where people are like, oh, well, but, you know, we really love that perfect sink that costs five thousand dollars. And I'm like, well, I think I have to kind of strike a balance here. And I think I'm still think I'm leaning towards the buying the slab pre-made because it's like I got enough projects to do in this kitchen. And, and my my wife and my daughter love these little these slabs that are pre-made. Um, the the absolute cheapest way that I thought of doing it though, and this is my old landlord did this years ago, is just hardwood flooring. Like buy unfinished hardwood flooring and put a plywood base down and install it like a floor. I mean, if you can walk on it, why isn't it durable enough to put on a countertop, right? I think that would be fine. I yeah. really do. So that's and still you, on the you know, table. you could do any species uh, depending on your taste, right? Yeah. So I think that from cheapest to most expensive, it's actually hardwood flooring is the cheapest the next is go to the lumber supply house and buy the rough boards but that's the most work um then it would be buying those slabs which is the easiest because you just buy the slab cut cut it to length put it drop it in place and throw some you know adhesive and screws in it's, it's and you're done but uh, it's also the most expensive it's like three times as much as doing hardwood flooring and about 40, 50% more than if I went to the local uh, woods, uh, you know, lumber place. That hardwood flooring idea is fantastic. Have yeah, I think so that? too. I haven't seen that done. Have you, have you seen I it? I don't done? know why more people don't do it. It seems yeah. like it would make a lot of sense. If you can mm -hmm. walk on the stuff, why can't you make a countertop out of it, right? Right. Do you could have dance on it too. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I have wood countertops and around the sink, there's mold. So you have to take precautions there. Yeah. And what kind I of not use it? What kind of a finish do you have on yours, though, Kylie? You know, I'm, I can't answer that. It's is it a hard, like a clear, hard, clear yeah. finish, like a polyurethane? See, that's yeah. the thing is I'm not going to do that because that makes it a much more of a maintenance uh, item for me. I've done, I've installed, you know, mineral oil coated. You know, it's a lot more maintenance in that you have to regularly oil the thing. But I find that to be a very satisfying process. And if it does get sun bleached or water stained, it's really easy break out your orbital sander and a rag and a bottle mm -hmm. of oil and you can make the thing look like brand new again and that's i feel like that's also what gives it the character over time yeah. that some people don't like that but i i actually More, really enjoy it mm -hmm, i like that look too kylie what have you been doing <clears throat> i've been painting i'm you know it's it's uh <laughs> rob shares his creative endeavors all the time so i thought why don't i i'm gonna do that today so um how's it I, going know, well, it gives me a lot of pleasure. It's, it's, you know, it's funny. I tried to, I was like, how can I relate this to building? And I thought, you know, when you're measuring and the difference a 30 second of an inch can make, that's the same with contours when you're painting mm -hmm. the diff, especially when you're doing portraits, which is what I like to do. Um, the difference between it, it is significant in the, you know, the look that you get. 
depending on which way you sh- stroke that one bristle. So, um, I, you know, that's what I've been doing. I've got one to share. It's a work in progress. I study Renoir a lot. He's one of my favorites. Um, so that's what I've and, been doing. And how, how much time at a, you know, at a sitting do you, do you work on this? Oh God, it can go on and on and on and on. Hours. Um, uh, many, you, you work in oil. Many hours. Oil, yeah. Yeah. And do you have a favorite time of day when you like to paint? No, but thank you for asking. I enjoy <laughs> it at all times. Actually, I, I did three hours today. What is it? Nine fifteen. So I was up at four, and by five, I was at my easel. So from five to eight. Are you painting in front of your north window for the consistent light? No, lighting is an issue. That's that's a tough one. And in fact, the one I'm working on right now is very subtle in terms of the blacks and browns. It's very dark painting. And, you know, there's no such thing as pure black. And, you know, I can draw very well, but I'm learning to paint. I mean, I've been doing it for since my teenage years on and off. But, um, you know, I have a long way to go. So um, the nuances, light really matters. And I have a hard time. I'm happy practically blind at this point too so between the light and my goggles i <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe maybe this is how we tie it into to home building is that we need to figure out where you need to put a big window in the side of your yeah. north side of your house <laughs> yeah, yeah it's right. on the north wall right that's where you want it yeah, yeah. that would be yeah. yeah you know there are only so many options but so anyway that's how I no, that's my cool. day. It must be nice. Your painting in. is very good, and I've Thank liked you. the other ones I've seen too. Thank you. I enjoy it very much. No small feat. How about you, should... Mr. Jeff? What have you been doing? Uh, really, just working outside. Nothing very. It's the time of year for it. Are yeah. you raking leaves yet? Uh, no. Did have been blowing a little bit, but that was just you know clear the driveway kind of stuff. Nothing. Mm-hmm. It's blowing a is not t- raking. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> And I hate raking, so I <laughs> avoid it at all costs. You know, I was thinking the other day, I was at the office. I'm so glad to not be hearing all of that. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. There's, so there's nice to uh, not hear that. every day leaf blowing it there. Yeah. So I've been working on my rusty cars, as I mentioned. The the coolant leak was terrible. Um, the part was is the, uh, I believe it's the thermostat housing, which oddly is on the bottom of the engine in this particular vehicle and really hard to get off. I can uh, show you guys the bruises and cuts I have on my arms from reaching into the engine compartment from the underside. Mm. And then I went to cut the grass on Sunday and blow the leaves around. And my lawnmower is smoking bad. And I'm, I'm like, yeah. I don't know what's going on. But at first I thought it was burning like insane amounts of oil. But I think it's actually burning a mouse nest that's uh, lodged on top of the exhaust manifold. So I got to tear into uh, that this weekend and see what's going on there. Would I that figured, happen with if, if your if your mower were electric? Could that still happen? I guess it could, right? Mm, well, they unlikely, might nest it. But... They might nest in it, but it's not going to like catch fire. You, yeah. you, I don't think. I mean, it might dry them out. <laughs> I'm sure it gets warm in there, but not quite as hot as an exhaust system on a right, gas right. mower. One so, more reason to buy electric. <laughs> I totally agree, Kylie. Um, part of me, and uh, this is a, a failing of. The greatest proportions, uh, I love smelly gas engines. I just really love <laughs> internal combustion engines. <laughs> I appreciate There's your just, honesty. There's just something about the stink and the loud and the it is very uh, unreliability. Manly. It's just awesome. <laughs> I come from a long line of car guys, right? My grandfather was a chauffeur. My dad was a service right? manager in car dealerships for decades of his life, you know? So I like cars I, and motors. <laughs> Rob, seeing fair. Rob's car and like seeing him tear it all apart kind of made me cry a little. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> I didn't break anything. It's still all going back together. That's what you, people say. You want to help me with that project, Patrick? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> I got I got enough rusty cars to take care of. We bought a boat. Did you guys see Dory? Your kayak. Yeah, your kayak. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did on uh, Saturday is we paddled our new Mad River Canoe three-person, 85-pound kayak. And boy, that was pretty fun. That is fun. Nice. Uh, The nice time of year to be doing it. Mm -hmm. I would much rather be doing that than spinning under the car, cutting my arms open. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy, we better get to some uh, feedback here. This comes from Ryan. Hello, I've been listening to your podcast for two years now, and it's become a mainstay of my podcast rotation. 
Every time you guys talk about blower door tests, I kick myself for not having shared my story. I'm a 30-year-old site supervisor slash assistant project manager in Philadelphia. The last builder I worked for did a fair amount of lead homes in the city. We used third-party inspectors. One was very particular about the details. After my first few blower door tests and some retests on builds, I decided to create my own blower door so I wouldn't waste his time while I ran around looking for leaks while he waited. My project began with a large HVAC blower that was bolted to a shop dolly. Rob, this has your name all, all over it. <laughs> it must have weighed 75 pounds. To make the door, I took a tarp, strapped I took a tarp, strapped it over some 2x2s cut from 2x stock so the edges were square and not rounded over. I used a ton of roofing nails to fasten the tarp to the frame. The frame was sized to fit inside a 36-inch door that we used across six lead builds. I would screw the frame to the jams behind the weather stripping. I used a piece of the tarp with industrial Velcro to fashion a collar to fit around the blower outlet. A little additional tape completed the job. My makeshift blower door worked better than expected. We would run the fan and have ample time to inspect the entire building and seal with caulk and spray foam when need, where needed, and I was quite proud of the air tightness numbers we were getting. Our biggest obstacle was preventing subs from damaging the Sika air barriers between fire separation walls and the row homes. They would blow nails through it constantly and some would cut it when it was in the way. Understandably, the blower motor fan was way overkill. I know we were way overpressured one day when the city inspector arrived to a meeting early, a rarity in Philadelphia. He decided to enter the row home from the rear parking lot and into the kitchen while the building was depressurized. He must have had a decent grip on the door handle because the pull of the door and whoosh of incoming air pulled him through the doorway and made him stumble into the room. <laughs> he caught himself and gave a laugh saying, that's a first for me. <laughs> that's funny. I love what you guys do, and I'm sure I'll have a podcast-worthy question at some point. I bought a 1930 row home fixer-upper in a really interesting Philadelphia East Falls neighborhood along the Skullkill River. I'd love to hear you how you pronounce that one. I think I said it right, right? I think, yes. I think you might have, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I did grow up in uh, Pittsburgh, that's Ryan's, right. so that's probably helpful. Dutch County. That means uh, in the river, by the way. I looked it up. It's a beautiful place, right? Mm -hmm. It is uh, I'm two years into intermittent weekend warrior projects. I'm sure there are behind the wall surprises that I will need answers to. Thanks, Ryan. Ryan, thank you. That was super cool. So there you go. You can make your own blower door. I, I think, you know, I think this is a new theme. I think more, I think we need people to send in their, uh, their own uh, homemade blower air, <laughs> air sealing, you know. Well, it's interesting. Projects. We we heard from a number of people who have done this. Uh, Doug yeah. Horgan was one. He cracked me up because they tried uh, a, a uh, floor dryer, like I suggested, and then they found that they needed two. <laughs> wow. Um, Mike Gerton has also done this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, if when you need a source of air pressure, uh, you can do that, right? If you have a fan. Yeah, I bet you you know some of those gigantic range hoods for those super sized industrial <laughs> stoves would work just fine, right? Right. So you put that in earlier in the construction process, and then you just use it for the rest of the build, right, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> That's efficient. Uh, this comes from John from Nichols Hills, Oklahoma. I've been a listener for about six months and subscriber for twenty five years. I really enjoy the content. The sawhorse segment was good. I want to plug the Rockwell Jaw Horse, not exactly a straight up saw horse, but very versatile for my projects. I also want to mention the Japanese pool saw. I could never get my bandsaw to cut square and true through the old growth twisted Oklahoma oak for a table project. Not the straight and true Midwest lumber. Every piece was out of square and I would lose too much material to plane. And I don't have anything other than a Bosch power planer. Uh, I'd use a track saw to get the edges of the planks to meet. A pool saw took some patience, but cut the tenon so precise, I just had to smooth them with chisels and sandpaper. I still need some tips on the mortising technique for out-of-square legs and braces. Keep up the good work and let me know if you have any questions about broken bones <laughs> bleeding. Yeah. So John. <laughs> so, Pat, go ahead. So, John is a doctor. <laughs> He's an orthopedist, I believe. So have yeah. you used um oh have you guys used the pole saws, the Japanese pole saws at all? No, 
doesn't surprise me. I, I have not really, Rob, but I do recognize their utility for sure. So I, I, I worked for a furniture restoration guy uh, part time years ago, and he was the first person who introduced me to those saws. And that was before you could even find them in any normal, uh, you know, hardware stores. And uh, the thing about them is just that the, the kerf is so slender. And by flexing the blade just the right way, you can make flush cuts without doing any damage to the surface of the wood. And uh, and if I don't, I mean, by now you think that most people have probably seen them, and in, 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 I think they even sell, to, you know, halfway decent ones at uh, the big box stores. But uh, oh my gosh! Yeah. And apparently, you can get like a really cool one at Harbor Freight for yeah. nine bucks, according to Justin Fink and a bunch of other people I've talked to. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely recommend them. When I was a gardener, Japanese hand tools were my absolute favorite for the precision of them. Not that you need precision when gardening, but they're just. The yeah, ergonomics. They're just so ergonomic and thoughtful yeah. and comfortable and make such human scale sense. I totally yeah. agree. Uh, the Tajima self retracting chalk line is one of my very favorite tools. And when I use that in front of other people who've never seen anything, you can just see their jaws just hang open, that the chalk line actually winds itself back into the box. There's like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And bones bleed. I didn't know that. Did you guys know that? I have to I don't want to know it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ever find out yeah. firsthand, that's for sure. That's very upsetting. I read all about it yesterday. I was like, why am I reading this? <laughs> <laughs> so, John, if you want to know how to make joinery with things that are out of square, you got to look to the timber framing trade, not the furniture making trade. So, <laughs> If you have lo uh, logs that have been squared up and you're doing a timber frame, they're going to twist and you have to deal with that in the building of the timber frame. So that's where you want to look to learn how to do joinery with wonky wood. Yeah. Do we have a piece on that? Find we have, we have plenty of stuff on timber framing, but it would also probably be a good idea to, to reach out to the Timber Framers Guild. That's like the, the place. That, that's the group of people that knows how to do this stuff the best. Uh, this comes from Carol. Hello, members of the podcast. I was listening to podcast 283 when someone said long home, hot log homes. I started to get a sick feeling in my stomach that I used to get when I would pull into my driveway and see that box of firewood looking back at me. <laughs> All I can say to your listener is run and don't look back. My wife and I built a log home back in the late seventies and I was 24 and it was the cool thing to do at the time. I thought that the happiest days of my life were when we moved into our new home. I was wrong. It was when we sold it and moved out. Log homes look nice at first, but they fast turn into a maintenance nightmare and a money pit. After just six years, we sold it, and from what I know, the house is on its eighth or ninth owner. The house was a full log shell and full log interior walls. After about a year, you could see the outside around the stone fireplace and the chinking between the logs. Windows and doors became harder to open, and insects were an ongoing battle. Also, don't get me started about heating the place. I just remember burning all my copies of Mother Earth News my first winter. <laughs> <laughs> That's not appropriate. They have like 122 articles on logging up on homes. I know they are better built now because of the mistakes of the past, but they still are a maintenance nightmare. Uh, Carol, your letter was fantastic. Yep. I really enjoyed reading that. There you go. Straight from the builder's mouth. Uh, this comes from Eric. I regularly listen to the Fine Home Building podcast and also some NPR podcasts on my daily commute. There recently was an NPR on the media podcast from September 2nd about the misreported move of Americans out from cities and into suburbs. The whole short episode about how this actually wasn't really a thing, but was an over-interpretation and misreporting of a realtor survey since this directly affects your market and the myth of moving out of urban centers was recently mentioned briefly in your podcast, I thought you'd be interested in a more objective take. Um, I didn't listen to this story. Did you guys listen to this? Yeah, what did you think, Kylie? Um, I thought it was really – I had heard it, but I didn't register it as I did yesterday when I listened to it again. Um, essentially, it talks about the, the this idea of the urban exodus on the suburban housing market, and it's a whole myth, and it really was about pent-up demand. Um, and it's not about the pandemic. It's just about plain old supply and demand, and, and the number of houses for sale is less than 30% of what was available at the, this time last year. Two thirds of the usual supply of homes for sale. That's what's driving up the prices, not outgoing migration from the city. But who the heck's buying these houses then if it's not folks moving out of the city? People well, no. would have been buying houses and couldn't at the time. I'm sorry, what did you say? 
Me? You said, yeah, you said it was something about people who couldn't have bought them at the time. Well, that the, the supply wasn't meeting the demand, I guess. Mm. People, there weren't as many houses for sale at the time that people would normally have been buying them in the spring, which is the hot time to buy houses, apparently. Uh, another thing, Patrick, on that is that, you know, we live in some of these outer rings further out from the city um, where you get a lot of weekenders who have second and third homes or who have enough money to buy a big country home. And um, I think, you know, what happens is you see a lot of of these people moving out of the city to these these outer areas, but they're not necessarily representing the majority of people in, in New York. They're just a, one small demographic, but they're a very visible demographic. Hmm. So I love this show. You, you guys know I have a communication degree, and, and this show is often very interesting to me. Um, I'm going to listen to this story. I, I can only say that I, I've just heard it from so many people that at least around here, and admittedly, we are you know, uh, a distant suburb of New York City. And, um, you know, people in New York City have lots of money and can buy houses uh, here pretty inexpensively, right? So I don't know. Maybe it's not uh, more widespread than than uh, than a few s- suburban uh, metro areas, but I, I don't know. He says, uh, this is Eric uh, once again. Uh, one other comment. In the same podcast, someone had wondered if only survivable job site accidents show up in the emergency department. At least in a few places where I've worked, uh, so Eric is, an, uh, is a doctor, uh, uh, at least in a few places where I've worked, people are routinely not declared dead at the scene of the injury. For multiple reasons, they are brought to the emergency room by the EMS and then declared dead at the hospital if their injuries were lethal. So it's likely that your emergency medicine physician, Dr. Art Henderson, would see many of the lethal job site injuries in addition to the career-ending injuries. As an aside, I am an ophthalmologist and only see the blinding injuries that sometimes end careers more often from bungee cords and hammers than power tools. Why do we always wind up here? <laughs> We're getting pretty some pretty morbid stuff going on here. But, but, but one, point, one thing I pulled out of that is that so many people I know, especially older people who have had years of working in, in any type of field where you're strapping things down, bungee cords... No. are they're just not a good idea I <laughs> spent about 15 strap years strap. yeah strap to straps are great <laughs> when i think about that you know when you're landscaping you're strapping debris down with a tarp on the back of a pickup truck multiple times a day i'm lucky i have my eyeballs <laughs> so andy uh grace and i have had this conversation more than once and i think we the original conversation regarding bungees at least in my experience on the podcast was related to th- Things that Andy says you can buy at Harbor Freight that were pretty good. And one of the things was bungee cords. And we yeah. heard from a lot of people who said, do not use these things under any circumstances. And when I was on Andy's job site recently, he just demonstrated the attention that you should be using on a bungee cord. You shouldn't have to use both hands to stretch it to connect it, right? If you just put a few pounds of tension on it, it does its job and you're not going to put your eye out if it lets loose. So I, I see both perspectives for sure. Yeah. But, you know, if you've got... If you've got a three foot bungee cord and it's not the right and it's the only one you got and you need to get it, you need to get the job done. You're going to put the tension that you need to get that thing to do the job, right? I think it Turn your head. <laughs> yeah. Ratchet straps. Ratchet straps are the answer. Yeah. Type of bungee cord matters too. Does it? Yeah, I think so. What's There's your both, favorite brand? Well, I, the ones I use the most and still do um, are the rubber. They're rubber. They're not the like nylon kind of. You're uh, talking the black. Sturdy rubber yeah. ones, not the ones that Those have like the fabric as, wrapped on them. Exactly. Those don't have as much give to them, so they require more tension. We'll have to ask Eric if he'll write in what common, uh, if he knows what the most common eye injury bungee is. Oh, did you really? Did you really <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not, enough of the injury. Yeah, right. All right. This is from Evan from Boone, North Carolina. Hey there, podcast crew. I have a question about zip sheathing in relation to fasteners. I am personally a believer in zip products and and their advantages, but as one that's never had the chance to install them, I'm left with a question about what happens after it is fastened. Would it not seem that the WRB WRB layer would be torn below the the sheathing and it would be exposed? What happens when water comes in contact with this spot? The worst case scenario mindset would say that the sheathing leather would end up de- sheathing layer would end up deteriorating to the point over over time. 
I understand that the majority of the fasteners would end up under the tape around the edges, but sometimes it would be in the center of the panel too, would it not? I have attached a picture of such an instance that I found in an article of the November 2020 issue of Fine Home Building. I hope you can shed some light on what might go on. Thank you, Evan from North Carolina. Well, so Patrick, you, it looks like you threw a link in the, in the script. That was the same one that I was going to go to on this one, right? You go ahead, Rob. So Christian Williamson, who, uh, people Christine, might know, right? Yeah. Christine yeah, Williamson, Christine. who people know, will maybe know, uh, if you're familiar with fine home building from our last year's summit, she was one of the, uh, speakers there is a building science expert, uh, on Instagram at building science fight club. And, uh, <laughs> she, um, She's all about uh, water, you know, water barriers. It's like one of her th- big focuses in her in the stuff that she teaches and 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 uh, consults on. And she, because this question comes up so often, she actually created a website called OverdrivenFastener.com <laughs> because awesome. she says people are just way too concerned about this problem. And and the gist of the, the of it is that oh, no. um, the amount of of holes you're actually creating in this water barrier and the fact that it's a vertical plane that's going to drain. She said that it's a non-issue um, that, um, that, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's an issue from an air barrier perspective, but I'm guessing if it's not fully penetrating, but she said, even if it's penetrating fairly deep into the surface of the sheathing. And even if it was every single screw. Yeah, it's not it's it's not a concern because of so one of the biggest things about build, one of the biggest things you have to think about in building science is the ratio of wetting potential to drying potential in houses. That's you know when people talk about houses getting wet and houses drying it doesn't matter if they get wet as long as they dry, can dry more readily than they can get wet. And, and they're so, going to get wet. So having a couple of dents in your WRB are, is not going to create enough of a wetting potential to counteract the drainage in the air. And, and you know, especially if you've got a, a vented green screen. green screen assembly. Uh, Christine's research uh, has uh, demonstrated this, right? And, and part of her thing is a stucco uh, claddings and other reservoir uh, claddings. And um, She's determined this is not an issue. So it's kind of unusual when we have an answer to a question, <laughs> right? <laughs> Proven. <laughs> a very well researched <laughs> answer <laughs> from a professional in the field, yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, this comes from Derek, longtime listener, first time questioner. I'm an Australian expat that's been living in the U.S. for a decade. I met and married my American wife in California, and recently we purchased a 1950s cottage-style house in the Tahoe foothills of California. It's been heavily added on to over the years. I count at least three, maybe four different additions slash modifications of various sizes and scopes. We love it. It has a lot of potential, and we are already many projects deep with many more to go. We are on the border of climate zone three and four, and depending on uh, what I'm doing, I generally choose the most advantageous (laughs) zone. (laughs) That's fair. (laughs) Today's email in question looks at the undone attic insulation project. As you would expect, the house is, for the most part, under or uninsulated, and the attic was not spared in this regard. The attic has none of the commonly expected insulation products. The only thing I can seem to find in the attic that might have originally functioned as, or at least was hoped to have functioned as, insulation is a thick fiber type board of some kind that seems to sit between the attic rafters, more or less in direct contact with a ceiling drywall. I've attached images of the product I'm talking about. My question is twofold. Firstly, what is it that I'm looking at? Should I be worried about this fiber board? Is it unsafe? Assuming it is all fine and safe, rather than attempting to remove it from my cramped attic space, which the slope is probably not more than 3 or 4 or 12, I was hoping to use it in helping air seal the attic space by sealing the fiberboard product to the rafter bays in the attic before stacking as much blown-in cellulose as I can on top of it all. I get that this might not be the best practices approach, but think it might be the easiest approach to achieve a relatively well-sealed attic space without the hassle of necessarily hunting down leaks, as I hope this approach will put virtually all the air sealing in the same plane 
the air sealing being done on the top of the fiber board. What do you think? Cheers, Derek. What do you think? What do you think? So what do you think that stuff is, Patrick? I think I, I think idea. it's the cell text that we've been talking about for the last two episodes of the show. So we had yeah. two other questions last time. Those folks had it on their sheathing, uh, you know, the wall sheathing. This happens to be uh, placed between the ceiling joists and uh, someone put it in there, I'm sure, as insulation. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems mm -hmm. thicker than the stuff I've seen as wall sheathing. What it looked like it was about two inches. Would you guys estimate? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at first glance, before I realized he was talking about um, it being sort of a fiber board material, I thought it was maybe just some compressed balsam wool bats, you know, mm. that, that was a similar kind of product where it's made out of fi wood fibers. Um, I mean, really, it, it, in all practical purposes, it's it's of the same basic makeup as cellulose. It's just made from wood fibers instead of chopped paper. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it looked pretty dense to me. It, it just like cellulose. It's probably not. You couldn't consider it an air barrier, but it's like like cellulose insulation. It's going to be more of an air, you know, blocking airflow more than than fiberglass bats would say. But uh, I think that's all fair assessments. My my worry would be that this is really not an airtight product, and if you try yeah. and seal around the perimeter to the to the roof frame or the ceiling joist, um, it's not really going to air seal. But I would be hard pressed to pull it out of there and go to that trouble in the space you're describing. Maybe it makes more sense to put the air barrier, you know, on the underside, the ceiling level, and you know, with a well detailed drywall, and make sure you seal up your can lights with inserts or whatever, and caulk around the the ventilation fans and then ducts that are, you know, punnet penetrating the ceiling diaphragm. But it's uh, none of it's like, ideal. This seemed like a good candidate for arrows arrows um, barrier. What do you what do you guys think of that idea? That's really hard to do in a in an occupied home. It's it's very mm -hmm. expensive to move all the stuff out of there or cover it to the degree that it's not going to get the sealant on it. I yeah, I, I, I would say in in a situation like this, I mean, you know, you're always going to want to do the best that you can do, but especially when you're doing DIY stuff in difficult situations, uh, I would say you kind of kind of have to find a happy medium. I, I would I would. I wouldn't worry too much about trying to air seal it to the to the framing or to the ceiling up there if anything uh if there's any gaps i might fill them uh with some spray foam but or or, or just if you're going to go over it with cellulose you, I, I don't know if it's worth it to really do much if you don't want to take the stuff out like you were saying i'd say focus more on interior air sealing details electrical boxes light can lights gaps in in moldings that sort of thing i mean it, it you know uh if you if you do want to air seal that that ceiling plane and do it properly, the only way would be to tear that stuff out. But I think, you know, it, you probably get as far as he really needs to go by without too much trouble by worrying about interior air sealing details. Jeff, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I agree. It's I think he's if he does you know good detailing from above and below without removing that stuff, he's probably ninety five percent of what he needs anyway. Would you take it out? No. I mean, yeah. Rob? No, that, that's going to be such a dusty, disgusting process. And it sounds like the access isn't that great. I mean, uh, if it was a, just a wide open attic that it was easy to just sort of shovel that stuff out of there, I might I might do it. But but if it's a difficult, if it's difficult to access, I would say just go over it with cellulose and worry about air sealing details elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Derek? Seems like good Make advice. your own blower door. <laughs> and see if it works. Yeah, right? there you go. It's, you know, try it out. <laughs> Honestly, I think that's what I, I think that's a good good advice for just about anybody. Make that <laughs> blower door, make your own blower door. And because like I think I told you when I the first time I ran a blower door in my house, there was a curtain across one of my closets that I hadn't replaced the door on. And the curtain was at like a 45 degree angle <laughs> from all the air leaks in that closet. And I'm like, that one closet probably accounted for like half the air leaks on the whole second floor of my house. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes you have those gaps that you just don't know where they are until you see that happen. Mm -hmm. So Minneapolis blower door, the energy conservatory, retro tech. Why don't you guys make a freaking consumer grade blower door? It doesn't have to be super duty. Just, just make it more affordable. So people who are into this can, can get one and, and do this work. Or, how much are blower doors? How much are they? A few thousands. thousand dollars, oh, like yeah. three, three or $4,000. At but least I, two. I want, 
Yeah, I wonder how much of that is the electronics, which is mm. yeah, all the sensors and the and everything. Yeah. yeah. So if you were just putting in, if they just took their frame and made a consumer grade fan that went into the same frame, that's all they'd really need to do. Or get the things into rental uh, places, right? You can't rent one, near, near as I can tell. Maybe folks will write in and say that I'm wrong about that. But wouldn't that be an awesome thing to get at the home center? A, mm -hmm. You know, a blower door. I feel and like I you can rent them. I feel like I've heard people talk about renting them. Patrick, well, stop, if you can track that down, that'd be great Patrick, info, we, Kylie. We should be starting this business ourselves. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, Jeff, can you do me a favor and just erase the last couple minutes of our yeah, conversation. No problem, yeah. <laughs> These guys just struck gold. <laughs> this comes from David. Hi, air ceiling team. I'm an architect that designs institutional buildings and enjoys making improvements to my home. Attached are some images from a big project last year, renovating my garage into a kitchen. I listen to you regularly. I enjoy the open discussion. My clients usually want a more definitive answer. <laughs> <laughs> we gave one to me. <laughs> I believe in the whole air sealing cult. I have not gotten there yet with my home, but I am in the planning stages. However, I'm reading a fascinating book, Healthy Building, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity by Joe Allen and John McCumber. My simple synopsis of his is, creating a healthy environment is more important than saving energy. They, they understand that building is about making choices and setting priorities. They start by pointing out that we spend a huge amount of time indoors, so the indoor environment is really important. If you can make the quality of the indoor env environment such that we are 2% or 5% more productive, or we feel that much better, how much is that worth? What I am realizing is that yes, air sealing is important, don't throw me out of the cult, but that air quality is more important. The problem is, how do you test air quality in your home? I don't think many of us can afford to put monitoring systems into our homes, although as I am writing this, I am thinking about the radon systems that are widely used, and I have a CO monitor in the house since we have a gas furnace. I have worked on office buildings where we have installed CO2 monitors. What do you think? Maybe having a leaky house is not such a bad thing. A tight house with an air exchange system would be ideal, but a tight house without good ventilation may be the worst choice. David. Well, I this think is that is the worst choice, right? Yeah. It, it, it... yeah, and you know, we probably don't really talk about that enough. When people are, are, are air sealing these houses, if you're living in a 50, 100 year old house, you're probably never gonna get to the point where you, meet the requirements for these elaborate uh, ventilation systems. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not reducing the quality of the air inside your house by, um, um, you, you just don't know, you know, you, who, especially if you're using certain, if there's certain materials in your house that are off gassing, or if you're causing moisture problems in your basement. Or more fundamentally, your furnace or boiler is not uh, drafting properly and you're filling your house with carbon monoxide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and radon is another good point. I mean, you, the tighter you make your house, uh, the more likely that when you do a radon test, you're, if you have a radon issue, that you're gonna, you're gonna get higher levels. Um, so we really should probably talk more about this when we talk about air sealing is that the more you, the tighter you make your house, the more you have to think about air quality. But he does have a good point too, that really, I mean, what is the most important thing? I mean, we're making our houses more airtight to make them more comfortable from a heating perspective or to make them, um, easy, you know, more affordable to, to heat. But, uh, but yeah, we don't really talk a lot about air quality has only been coming up really in the general media in the past few years and these monitors that are available there's an article um there's a couple articles on green building advisor about air quality testing and air quality meters and just this year and i'll put the links in the podcast for that but there's just really not enough knowledge about it and this it's it's even hard to know how well these sensors are working that you can buy for your home now that are testing uh you know particulates in the air kylie so, what do you what do you think about this subject well, I mean, there's, there, you know, there are reasons to tighten up your home. Um, and I think you can get to a point at which you need those advanced, you know, ERVs or HRVs. But I think there's a middle ground, too. And in fact, Scott Gibson, based on a conversation that Brian and I just had, is going to do a piece along these lines, because it's something I was thinking about. Essentially, what he's saying is that 
if, if you're not to that point, but you want better air quality, there's got to be a middle ground. And, and Rob, you make a good point. Scott also did a piece of look at um, air quality mo monitors for home use. And there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of products out there, but you don't necessarily know how well they're working. Um, Kylie, do any of them work? Is, is there a I mean, recommendation that we can give people? Really, yes. I think the people who are interested in buying something sort of in that middle range just to monitor what's going on in their house. And, and they all, there's so many models and they measure different things from, you know, particulate matter to VOCs to measure temperature, humidity, and carbon, di carbon dioxide. But um, there's a lot of studies out there. And I, and I think it's one of those things where, you know, you're just going to have to do your research and, and, and find what might work for you. I think, um, you know, software is a key piece of that whole thing. And I don't know, it, it seems like a complicated thing that there aren't some solid answers to, but there's a lot of research out on. Um, but Scott is actually going to do a piece along the same lines of what we talked about last time, which is what can you get? And in fact, Allison Bales is too. It's, it's a, it's a recurring theme. People are very concerned about their indoor air quality, seemingly all of a sudden for a variety of reasons. Do you um, know what the reasons are? Well, I think the pandemic has people thinking about air circulation and air quality. Mm -hmm. I think all the fire wildfires are getting people thinking about it too. Mm -hmm. um, people are spending more time indoors than they used to or more time in their homes than they used to. Um, you more know, time oil painting? <laughs> time oil painting. <laughs> So Scott's going to do a piece and Allison is going to do a piece about the things that you can do on a more mid-grade level. You don't have a super tight house, but you've done some things to improve the air tightness of your house. What's what's the middle ground for you? You know, um, what kind of filters should you be using? What kind of ventilation system can you afford? Um, what are some simple things you can do? I, I, I'm looking forward to both those pieces. They're coming yeah. up. Well, in the meantime, certainly we'll put a link to Scott's. Um, he did a Sort of, sort of a review on the tester testing equipment that's available, and a couple of manufacturers even gave him models that he could test out for a while. So he was, are you looking at that right now, Rob? Yeah. One so, of them is, is it air, is it easily oh, discernible? What are the good things to buy? Uh, you know, I think he he was able to test a few of the models. One was by Aware, and yeah. one was by Katera. Mm -hmm. Katera, and um, you know, was comparing the the um, how accurate they were compared to each other. And uh, not very. Yeah, it was it was it's tough. I think this is a new it's a new area that I think in the next few years we're going to see a lot more advancement in. But uh, more than just like thinking about um, testing your air, thinking about the materials that go into your house is a big part of it, too. Like in my house, I'm very sensitive to certain chemical smells. I'm not saying I'm like I have any like health problems directly related to them but but you don't like, like things that stink yeah so and one of the big things is, is, <laughs> like is carpet <laughs> yeah yeah I, yeah i didn't mind a stinky gas motor once in a while but uh, <laughs> but but not in my house <laughs> but no like so you know so many people have wall-to-wall -wall carpets and they're made out of synthetic materials and to me all of the foam backings and the pl plastic materials that those carpets are made out of like i can tell when i walk into like a new hotel like that mm -hmm. smell from like, yeah. the vinyl wallpaper and the and the and the carpets and so i buy nothing but wool carpets like wool rugs because they're you know i, I mean we have a hard you know with the old wood floors in our house so i just have area rugs but um I find that it makes a huge difference in my comfort in the house to to have materials that are not gotcha. made out of off-gassing synthetic, you know. I th th that's that's very true, and I you guys um, tease me about my liking of stinky things, but like I brought <laughs> uh, luxury vinyl tile flooring into the house, and it was in there for two days. Uh, in boxes. And I was like, I'm not putting this in the house because mm. it stunk like a Christmas tree shop. You guys ever been in one of those horrible places? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Did you get rid of it? Did you send it back? Yeah, I took it back. For you. That's when we decided to refinish the, the floor in our bedroom, you know? Yeah. And there's so many things like that that we bring into our houses. Like one of the stinkiest things in our uh, that we switched recently is the vinyl shower curtains. Yeah. Those yeah. Things, you know, you take them out of the bag and it's just mm -hmm. overwhelming. So we switched to a polypropylene oh. washable one recently. Mm -hmm. You know, so the most important things with regard to indoor air quality is you cannot have backdrafting appliances, right? If you have combustion appliances, they have to be working correctly or that is really, 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 really a dangerous thing. Um, you know, the, the VOCs and plastics and paints and coatings, those are bad too. Uh, and they're often in panel products. Um, 
I, I'm getting a little bit beyond my expertise in the area, but I know the Canadians did some research and they figured out that like three air changes per hour was a reasonable air tightness uh, level that you, you, you weren't wasting energy, but you also weren't risking uh, the uh, buildup of contaminants in your indoor air. So, I mean, I think if, 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 you, if you shoot for that, um, you should be okay. But of course, if you're like got an oil painting hobby or a carburetor <laughs> cleaning hobby or whatever, you know, you're going to have uh, problems. So you need to be thinking about these, the sources of, of the things that are messing up your indoor air. Yeah. yeah. It's and upsetting when you start really dwelling on it. It gets, you know, you think, am I causing myself brain damage? <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, I don't about worry this. about it at all because it's six point three air changes. Like I'm more worried about freezing to death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you gonna say, Rob? It's I was going to say, I wonder, right. It's important. I wonder, um, even at those levels, like, is it worth it to put in one of those Lunos? Uh, you yeah. know, really affordable what ventilation. Levels? Well, when you're getting down to like above three, you're still above three air changes per hour. Because I mean, Boy, the thing I think is, the, the air is going to take the path of least resistance. So, I mean, you know, you know that if you've got a leaky house, the air is mostly coming through gaps in your walls. So, um, I don't know. I, I'd like mode. to. I, I think we need to do a little more research on that kind of stuff and get more information to our audience about. You know, what are their options if they start making their houses tight enough to uh, to affordably ventilate the house? Mm-hmm. I think it's a great article idea. So uh, what are our affordable options like, you know, uh, bath fans that are wired on timers or run continuously? Um, the Lunos is a little less affordable, I would say. I think those things are like a couple thousand bucks for you need two of them. Um you know, when you get starting to get to ERVs and HRVs, you know, they're thousands. And if you get the really good ones, they can be 10 grand. So, so Allison Bales just sent me the head and deck for his next piece. I haven't, he hasn't sent it in yet, so I can't say, but this is what you can expect. It's improving the indoor air quality with a DIY portable air cleaner. All you need are a box fan, MRF 13 plus filters, cardboard, and tape. So... <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait. I know. I'm very anxious to read that. <laughs> That'll be coming out next Thursday. So, Rob, for our consumer blower door, we put some MERV filters on there too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a dual purpose. When you're not using it to do air, air, air sealing, you can use it to actually clean your air in your house. Oh, my God. This is brilliant. <laughs> okay. Sh- all right. We can't up, talk about I this feel anymore. Like I need to change my furnace filter right now. <laughs> when was the last time you did it, Kylie? You know, it, this conversation made me realize it's it's overdue. It's been at least. I feel like we're doing an intervention. What was the last time you changed your furnace filter, Kylie? <laughs> <laughs> Today's the day. You should be doing that every three months. I know, and it's yeah. been at least. And your five. stuff is down in the crawl space. Yeah, basement. Five a full basement. You should probably do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right, this is John from St. Louis. Hey, guys, I was wondering if you could vent a bath exhaust fan with thin wall PVC pipe. Crazy, brilliant, or none of the above? <laughs> Thanks for all you do, John from St. Louis. All right, I think it's great. I, I tell people to do this all the time. It's oh, the really? perfect material. It's smooth, it holds water, so when you have wintertime condensation, because the pipe's going through an unconditioned space, like your attic, uh, if you slope it to the outside, it gets the water running out of the building and set it back into the, into the, uh, into the bathroom. And we have uh, details of how to do this the right way, and uh, we'll make sure we put those up on the podcast page. Yep. Once, oh my God, we're, we're like, we got, we're batting 500 today. We got real <laughs> answers for two questions. <laughs> You know, and, I, I was looking on the forum and some guys were even talking about using the foam core PVC because then you're going to have less chance of condensation inside the... Oh, because uh, it's better insulated. There. Yeah. And, oh. and and somebody was even saying, oh, how the heck do you attach a four-inch piece of PVC to the... or, or a three-inch piece of PVC to the one of these fan, uh, you know, the outlet on the fan? And That's a guy, good question. One guy used a Fernco. That was one of those rubber clamp nice. uh, connectors because they get some rubber... It's a, a watertight rubber connector, so you use your, it's got hose clamps on it, so you can tighten it to whatever diameter that you're uh, putting it around, and it fit nicely around the fan outlet and around the pipe. Brilliant. 
That is awesome. So, but if you didn't, if you couldn't find a fern co that made that that transition, you you could use a piece of flex duck there, and you know, and pull it tight so it doesn't have a bunch of wrinkles and sags in it. And ah, uh, oh, fantastic solution. Yeah, or, or bend up a piece of sheet metal and use the appropriate tape. Why would you do that? It's going to be cold. It's going to be a condensing surface. Well, I'm talking about right at the ag- exit of the fan itself. We're talking uh, about a couple of inches here. I, of course, the metal fab guy would be like, oh, yeah, just bend up some metal and weld it up there, and we're going to make that connection. I'm going to use my uh, telewell welder up there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, once again, I'm going to put you on the spot, Rob. Hey. Uh, what, what are we supposed to talk about today? Hey, well, you know, it's only we're only two weeks away from the summit. And we know it's a we ever we know by now it's a virtual summit, so it's not uh, the in-person event that we had last year. Unfortunately, hopefully we'll be back to that next year. But it still is uh, fourteen amazing speakers that uh, some of some return speakers from last year, um, and we still have the same session format, which is um, you know we go from the beginning of the day is these big. Uh, group sessions like a, like a typical webinar where you've got a speaker uh, talking about a, a broad topic but then we as you get through the day we narrow down into uh, breakout sessions which are more like classrooms so that's a lot more interactive so you're unlike a webinar you're getting more uh, interaction with the, with the speaker so you there's q a sessions with that and then and we but, have special software that's supposed to facilitate this is that right rob yes yeah, so we're on a we're on a new platform it's not just a basic zoom call so it's going to be like you're at a virtual event there's going to be uh um there's going to be a landing page that is sort of like the lobby and you can see all the sessions that are going on at that time and you can go in and out of the different sessions so if you go into one and you find it's not what you were looking for you can walk out the virtual door and go into the other session. And uh, so it's without you know, the embarrassment of walking out of a live <laughs> session. Yeah. You don't have to worry about tripping over your, your, your swag bag and <laughs> the guy seeing you walk out the back door. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then also um, then at the end of the day, we're going to have what they're calling round table sessions. So those are uh, more intimate discussions with some of our editors and some of the speakers so that you can uh, have, uh, the best to the best of our abilities that what made the the uh, event special last year, which is a, is a much more personal a- interaction with people that that share a lot of common interests with you, and uh, so you know it's 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 gonna I think it's gonna be a great experience still. And uh, I also have to mention that just like last year, we had the uh, vendors uh, there who were I think just as a, we we had a hand picked group of vendors that were really related to the topics you know it wasn't uh, you know we didn't have like the massage chair vendors (laughs) or the you know the the whole you know the window cleaning vendors it's all about stuff related to the construction details and 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 good stuff not crappy stuff yeah really good stuff and so the vendors are even having virtual booths so they will be having presentations probably videos and uh, uh some of them will even have people on hand to ask answer questions about any of the materials and some of those materials are things that we talk about regularly in our in the classes that, that we'll have. So it, I think it's going to all dovetail nicely together. And if you haven't registered yet, go to summit.finehomebuilding.com and you can get uh, tickets there. And of course, it's a lot more affordable than um, than going to the in-person event, both in ticket sales and the fact that you don't have to travel there and you can go there from anywhere anywhere in the world. So hopefully we have a good turnout. I'm going to take this opportunity because I can to plug my own session, which is going to be on Thursday night, and we're going to be talking about HVAC problems. So I'm hoping all of you who listen to this show will email me or the podcast page with your HVAC questions, and we're going to have one amazing session where we're going to pepper experts with HVAC problems and solutions. So uh, I, it's going to be so cool. I think like, you're doing that. Good chumps. for you, man. That's awesome. <laughs> it, it's gonna be uh it's gonna be awesome i'm sure that's great uh, any of you like have a, any you're a full-on personality you're joining us on the bs and beer show this week too i'm the hardest working uh <laughs> You are person a media in, in, giant. In, in construction media. I'm the James Brown of construction media, is what Ian Schwant said. <laughs> I feel awesome. good. <laughs> oh, but before we get up, before we get off these topics, though, I just want to list a couple of the sessions. We've got uh, building houses that capture carbon. 
We have oh. uh, Designing High Performance House Step by Step. That's by Michael Maines. Nice. Uh, Mike Curtin's going to be talking about does advanced, advanced framing make sense, which I know a lot of uh, regular builders wonder, is it worth it to have less lumber in your house to make room for more framing? And, uh, and Mike's going to tell us all about that. Um, Matt Milham, well, he's going to be talking about in one of the roundtable discussions, uh, natural building. Is it a fringe or a fad or is it the future of building? But uh, and there's dozens more. I'm going uh, to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> even if it's just to heckle him, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's just so many more really good talks, and it's all going to be very relevant to the stuff that we all care about. So uh, I hope to, I hope many of you people all many of our listeners can make it there. Yeah, it's. Awesome. I, I hope to see you all there too. It's super fun, and I think you'll agree. Oh boy! So anything else? What do you got, Kylie? I'm done. I feel like we're way over you're, here. You're, you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's because she's been up for eight hours. I, know, right? <laughs> I think it's because she's breathing the paint solvents all day. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Rob, Kylie, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your questions to FHB Podcast at Taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. Let us other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Happy building. I'm going to make another appeal. Please review us on iTunes if you would. Uh, we do pay attention. Fill out the survey that you'll find on the podcast page at the findhomebuilding.com website and uh, help us out with uh, telling us how you feel about the show. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Stay safe and happy building once again. Mm-hmm.